Hello? Do you hear me? Okay, good. Uh, I'm a bit early, but let's get going. So, kind of surprised to see so many people who want to see this sort of niche topic. And I see there's some real-time people here as well, so they'll probably bash me for the title, so we'll see. Uh, I figured I started right away with some, like a teaser. You know, everybody lo loves benchmarking and, you know, depending on the kind of person you are, you might be scared off. So if so, now's the time to leave. Uh, so here's a test where I'm blasting a host with uh, 50 million packets per second. And uh, we we'll have two different mechanisms for receiving the packets. So in the first, uh, three different tests. So in the first test, we only receive the packet and we drop it. In the middle one, we actually generate packet from the host and try to send as many as possible out. And the third, we do simple MAC swapping. So we receive the packet, we swap it, swap the MAC address and send it back out. And as you can see, the light blue here, uh, we're using something called 8th packet, which has been around in the kernel f since forever. I guess Jonathan can probably tell us when it was introduced, but it's been around forever. So, and it's typically what's used for TCP dump, for example. So it's the mechanism for receiving raw frames in the Linux kernel. Uh, as of 4.18, a new mechanism came up, which is called XTP socket, and that's what I'll be addressing here. Uh, and as you can see, you know, it's a nice benchmark, at least if you're coming from XTP land. So, sort of, a packet roughly maxes out about one million, and whereas uh, XTP sockets has much better performance. All right, so before we actually can start, we need some word from our sponsors, the legal department, and you're not supposed to read all of it, but I really like the second bullet here, so. No computer system can be absolutely secure, and you know, being from Intel and tying back to what Greg said this morning, it's, you know. <laughs> all right, so a little bit about me. So my name's Bjorn, and I'm uh, working for this big ship center, uh, and uh, I'm mostly working with Linux network and things on the Intel side. Uh, I maintain the XTP socket and together with my good friend and colleague Magnus. Magnus, you can please wave. Uh, and on top of that, I also maintain the RISC-V BPF jet. All right, so XTP sockets, what is it? And why should you care? So before I actually get into what XTP socket is, we need to do some TLA, that's three letter acronym. So with a show of hands, how many people here know what BPF is? Okay, that's, that's good. So BPF, I'll just do the whirlwind tour then. Uh, BPF is Ber or stands for Berkeley Packet Filter, and it's a mechanism where it lets a user uh, insert snippets of code into various hooks in the kernel. So you can use it for tracing, and you can use it for extending the kernel in a safe way. So the, the biggest selling feature with BPF is that it, well, while you can in, uh, insert a snippet of code, it cannot crash the kernel. So that's sort of the killer feature. Uh, so way back at a NetDev conference for a couple of years, uh, back uh, Tom Herbert and Alexis Tarvoito had an idea like, what if we add a BPF hook at the earliest place possible in the receive path? And where's that? Well, that's right after the DMA has been completed. And they named this hook XTP, which stands for the Express Data Path. So the idea is that, okay, we have this uh, receive hook where we uh, insert a BPF program. So what can you do with this BPF program? Well, first, you can, after you receive a packet, you can modify the packet, okay? You can drop the packet, you can take the packet and send it back out on the same interface again, and you can do redirect. That means you receive a packet, uh, you take the packet and send it back out on a, on a different network interface card. You can take the packet and pass it to kernel, telling the kernel like, hey, please process this packet on a different core. And finally, you can actually take the packet and pass it out to a socket. And that's the XTP socket. So it's a way of getting packets real fast from the XTP program. Right, so this is sort of the picture of how it all fits in. So at the bottom, you have the network interface card. You see the XTP hook there. Everything in dark blue has, is related to BPF. Uh, okay, I don't have a pointer, but 
you see the BPF maps. BPF maps, it's, a it's sort of a structure that, you know, that can be shared between user land and the kernel to pass information back and forth between BPF and the user. Uh, so if you take the regular flow there, uh, the Nick received the packet, <coughs> went to the XP program. You can do various decisions there again. You can drop it. Uh, you can redirect to the XTP socket, which you can see right on top of the XP program. Uh, you can pass it to the regular networking stack, which is done by uh, something called XTP pass. So you just receive a packet and you pass it directly to the stack. Uh, and then when it actually enters uh, the regular stack, it will create a structure called the SK buff or the socket buff, or just SKB for short. And that's uh, the kernel representation of a packet. So when you have a networking packet in the kernel, it's an SKB, unless it's in the XP world, because then we don't have an XP because it's so early. Make sense? Uh, and as you can see, and this is part of what, where the performance comes from, like there's a whole lot more code when you go up to the AF packet than compared to AF XTP. Clear? Good. All right, so how do you actually use this then? So on the left, you have a regular INET socket, and this time it's, for example, UDP sockets. So you start off by creating a socket, you bind it to some uh, address, uh, and then you start receiving packets and sending packets. And typically, each receive and each send is a system call. And on top of that, you need to copy data from the kernel side to the use land. And as, again, as Greg pointed out, system calls has become much more expensive nowadays with all these mitigations around. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have the XTP socket program, which is, again, as you can see, much more code, so it's much more complicated to use. And this is true, again, for uh, if packets. So typically, like, easy to use, not, not as fast, which is a shame, but we can, we'll get back to that later. Uh, you start off by you start off by creating a socket of type XTP, uh, and then you allocate something that we call the packet buffers. That's just an area where you want to place the packets. Uh, and this packet area is divided into fixed uh, sized chunks. So, for example, if you when you register the packet area later was uh, state that, okay, each, this packet area is divided into chunks that are, say, 4K. So you can't receive packets larger than 4K, in that sense. Uh, and then you register to the kernel. And so, and this is the first optimization. Like, you don't have to do copies anymore because you let the kernel know that this is my area where I actually will place the data. Third, you create a couple of rings. Yeah, and I'll get back to uh, how these rings uh, look and how you use them. But the idea is that instead of using explicit system calls, you use rings to pass uh, events back and forth, or you pass ownership of buffers. So in these rings, and that's also the difference between uh, uh, regular sockets and a packet is that you actually pass descriptors to the data. You don't pass the actual data. Now I'll get into the details where, uh, how these descriptors look like later. Uh, right, and then, okay, so these rings, they're shared between the kernel and the user, so it's a shared structure. Finally, you do a bind call, and the bind call is kind of special. Uh, instead of having address, you have a device and then a queue. So most, or I would say all contem uh, contemporary NICs nowadays have multiple receive and send queues. So typically on Linux, the default setup is that you have one receive queue and send queue per core. Uh, so for AFXP, you, can, you have to select a certain hardware queue. So for example, if your NIC has, or is configured to have four receive queues, you will need to create four AFXP sockets. And then finally, you start receiving events from the rings and sending events to the rings. And you also, so the question is, do we need any system calls at all? Well, truth is we need some, but I'll get back to that later. 
And again, this is, you know, this is a lot of boilerplate code. So what we've done is we sort of tried to make it easier to use by hiding it into a library called libbpf. And libbpf is part of the kernel as well. So you can, like my opinion, don't write this raw code, use the library instead. All right, so this is what the, uh, the XP descriptor looks like. So it's really simple, it's an address, it's a length, and a set of options. So let's start, so options is not used. We have some ideas for that to use it for, uh, to chaining packets. Because as I said earlier, the chunk size is fixed, so you can only receive packet of a, like smaller than the chunk size. Uh, the address is not a user point pointer, or user land pointer, it's actually the offset into this packet buffer. So for example, the, the first chunk in your buffer array, that's zero. So zero is not a null point pointer, it's a valid offset. And length, again, the length of actual packets. So if you have data within these chunks that's less than a chunk, so say we have 64 bytes, the length will be 64. Oh, as you can see in the top there, that's where you find the uh, UAPI as well. So it's in, yeah, Linux IFXTP. Okay, so here are the rings. So for each uh, XP socket, there's at least, or there's at least two rings, but typically there's four of them. So first there are the receive ring, the RX ring, and there's the transmission ring, the TX ring. And corresponding to each of those rings, there are a couple of more, and I'll get back to those later. So there's a field ring and a completion ring. So let's start, so to receive a packet in the RX ring, in this case, the user land process is the consumer and the kernel is the producer. So the user will read off or pick XP descriptors from the ring and then bump the consumer pointer. Uh, so what are we using this field ring for? Well, the idea is that, as remember, we registered the memory to the kernel. And this mechanism, the field ring, is used to pass ownership from the user land to the kernel. So we, uh, to, and as you can see, that's not a complete descriptor. It's just the address field. Because we don't need to pass the length when we pass it to the kernel. We just need to say, like, use this chunk. Make sense? Okay, good. And same thing with the completion ring. So it's sort of the upside down version of the Oryx side. So instead of the kernel being the producer, it's uh, the user space application being the producer. So we pass descriptors into the, uh, into the ring, we bump the, point, uh, uh, the head pointer, and it will be consumed, it will be consumed by, the, by the kernel. And when the kernel has sent out the frame, it will re return uh, the chunk back to the user land application via the completion ring. So it's one way of looking at, at these rings is passing ownership back and forth between the kernel without doing system calls. All right, so this sounds good and everything, but do, do we need syst system calls? Well, yes is the short answer. So since we're using sh shared rings between the kernel and the use land, the kernel need to pull these rings to get the events. And one could imagine that, yes, we could have a kernel thread running and just picking trying to pick events as fast as possible, but in reality, that's, you know, it's wasteful of resources. So instead, uh, we have a flag in the rings that the user need to check, it's called need wake up. So you check this flag, and if, if the ring sort of signals to uh, the user application that, hey, hey user, you need to wake the kernel up, and you wake it up with a system call. Uh, for example, a send message or uh, the poll system call. So that is, or when, for example, if you're receiving packets, then the kernel will have, uh, will be w uh, woken up asynchronously, so you won't need any system calls. But for example, when you're actually sending stuff, then, and not receiving, then you need to explicitly tell the kernel, like, wake up and empty the ring. Uh, and also, and I'll get back to this later. So if, for example, if a user forgets to, uh, to add entries into the fill ring, uh, the, the receive path will be stored at some point. 
and if it's stored, it's no, what's, what's the point of polling? So instead it sets the need wake up flag and the kernel goes to sleep or the, or the kernel process or kernel thread doing the, uh, the reception. And this sort of ties into other or big difference with uh, these kind of sockets compared to usual sockets. So with XTP sockets, the allocation is done. The kernel allocates frame from the user, from the user land provided buffers. Whereas the usual socket, like a regular socket, they would you know, use the page allocator, allocate frame, put it on the uh, NIC hardware uh, ring, and then receive the buffer. Here instead, we actually allocate from the user land. So it's really important that compared to other application, the user land application need to be uh, well behaved. So for example, you need to say on the receive path, for example, you need to fill the field ring in order to receive packets. And also you need to empty the receive ring in order to receive packets. If the ring is full, you won't get any packets. And similar on the transmission side. So if you place a lot of packets on the send ring, but you don't empty the completion ring, well, you won't send any packets. All right, so some pointers where you can find more information. So uh, first is documentation, top one. And then there's a sample application in samples BPF. Uh, and also the library that I talked about, which sort of hides most of the messy details. It's called libbpf. You can find that there. Uh, I think there's a standalone version of libbpf that Facebook is maintaining. Uh, so there's, it's somewhere on GitHub, but they, uh, typically pick like stable releases of the BPF and package it. So you can, if you're not, uh, like if you don't want to handle the whole kernel tree, that, then that's one way of doing it. All right, so. Maybe say that you want to implement support for this in your own driver. So how many here are show of hands, how many here are driver developers? Okay, so that's like one third. Uh, what do you need to your, say that you have a driver that supports regular Linux networking? Uh, because as you remember from the first diagram, you need explicit support for XTP. So you need to do modifications for the drivers. So that's sort of the cost of the extra performance. Uh, before we get into that, we need to, so what is needed from a driver perspective? So again, let's say that you have a driver that's, uh, you know, have basic uh, Linux support. So you have a driver in the kernel tree. Uh, the, f the first thing you do, since these rings that I talked about, they are lockless and they're single producer, single consumer. So we need to make sure when we're producing to these rings, that there are uh, only one, like they need to be synchronized. Uh, and what most N uh, NIC that implements XP does is uh, relying on something called NAPI. So NAPI is an abstraction that uh, uh, the network and device drivers use to, well, implement the bottom half after an interrupt. So you receive an interrupt and then, or it's, it's a way of deferring work. And it's built on top of the software queues. So software queues are guaranteed to be only run once per core. So for example, if you have a really old driver that's not using NAPI, then you need to make sure that you only produce, like you only, <laughs> you only have one writer to the rings. I think actually most drivers in Linux now are based on NAPI, so but there might be some old stuff around. Uh, this, so that's the first thing. So when XP started, that idea again, a hook in the driver and uh, this was, you know, that it was a grandiose idea. But in reality, 
adding support for XTP has taken a really long time. So the idea, you know, it's like four years, four years old and still the amount of drivers that actually support XTP is fairly few. So what the community decided on was adding something called like a generic or a fallback mode for XTP. So, and so this is adding an XTP hook right after the SKB has been allocated. So it's like, an, it's a slow version of XTP, but it was added in order to make sure that, you know, people can start playing with XTP with actual driver support. So again, for the best performance, first, you need to add proper XTP support to your driver. Secondly, uh, if you do that, well, you get better performance, but you st still won't get the best performance because you're not doing zero copy. So regular XTP support still allocates frames from the page allocator. And in order to uh, get zero copy support, that is the, the frame that would pass from user land is placed directly on the ring hardware buffer then we need additional support to drivers. So there's like a two phase. First, add XTP support. Thir uh, secondly, uh, add uh, uh, zero cup support. All right, so this only addresses the zero cup support. So when you start off by adding SP support, you have the, let's see, like these, the first two NDOs. So that's callbacks into the uh, driver implementation. The first one called NDO BPF, that's the one that sort of registers the program, or the XP program to your driver. Uh, right. The XP transmission func uh, transmit function, that's used for uh, redirect, d redirect to other interfaces. Uh, so that's sort of, if you implement the XTP, you have support for that. If you want to add zero copy support, you need to, one additional uh, uh, callback, and that's to wake up the kernel, which I talked about earlier with the system call. So you, you, we need a mechanism to wake up the kernel. Uh, what else? Yeah. So we add the zero copy support by adding a, uh, uh, adding a structure to the driver called the UMEM. And the UMEM is the abstraction from the XTP, uh, AFXP layer that contains uh, the packet buffer and the fill and completion ring. So the idea is that use this UMEM structure and instead of using the page allocator, you allocate from the UMEM. And also it, it exposes the rings that you can use to uh, uh, complete the trans transmission, uh, <laughs> the, the sent uh, packets, and also to uh, uh, allocate from the field ring. All right, so here, again, as you can see, there's a lot of Intel drivers there, so and the most recent one is the ICE driver, which is a 100 gig driver. Uh, the first one is a 40 gig driver, and IXGB is the older 10 gig one. And also Mellanox has had the support for their newer NICs, uh, and uh, I think Broadcom is working on it. Or they are, but we'll see when it actually arrives. Uh, so, I thought I'd finish up with some uh, benchmarks. So the set test up is as following. So I used a fairly new kernel uh, from the BPF Next Tree, which is a pre-5.5 kernel. Uh, I have a you know fairly new Skylake machine uh, that's pinned to three gig gigahertz uh, and a four gig NIC. And the idea is that, that I have a XCF packet generator that just blasts packets to the, uh, to the host. I just, I'm just using one receive queue and one send queue from the hardware. Uh, I annotated uh, the scenarios with two, two cores and one cores. And two cores mean that the software queue is running on a different uh, 
core or the kernel side processing is running on different core than the useLine application, whereas one core everything, kernel and everything runs on the same core. Uh, and the latency measurement is sort of, it's kind of naive actually, to be honest. It, what I've been doing is I just add instrumentation to the Ixia, send the packet, loop the packet back to the packet generator and, and measure the end-to-end -end latency. Right, so this is the first one that you saw uh, at the beginning. Uh, as you can see, AF packet really maxes out at about roughly <coughs> one million packets. Uh, and just a note here, uh, when we added, when we started this work, you know, all the meltdown and Spectre stuff weren't around, but we're seeing, I mean, we're really getting hurt by the Spectre V2 stuff. So I think the, on the receive side there, we dropped close to 10 million packets. So we need to work that back again. Uh, so this is two cores. And as you can see, one core is a drop. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the packet uh, max swap completely dies for some reason. So it's non 9K of packets there. Uh, but still, if you compare two cores to one core, it's still, I mean, uh, performance per core is still better on one core. Uh, what else? Interestingly, you can see that TX only here maxes out at 21 uh, million packets. And that's because that's the hardware limitation. So you can't get out more packets than 21 million there. So if we add an additional socket there, we could probably get more packets out. All right, so this is uh, the end-to-end -end lat latency. So again, what I did, I just you know, instrumented the packet and went it back, uh, just looped it back with a max swap. Uh, Latency in micros, you know, it's really good here. But then again, like, this is really few system calls. So, but in terms of latency-wise, we're really good compared to uh, a packet. Whereas if we actually, you know, dial up the packet rates with this, this sort of fire hose scenario, we go from, you know, micros to actually millis. But the worst case for uh, XP sockets is still like one digit uh, millis. So I think it's still pretty good. And that's about it, actually. And as usual in these kind of things, there's a lot of people involved. So thanks to all these people helping out, you know, writing code, testing stuff. So. So I figured it's a bit early, but if you have questions, I'll be happy to ask them. I have a mic up here, so. None? Okay. Thank you for listening. <laughs>